Hey everybody, if you enjoy the podcast and the content it provides, be sure to hop over and check out the community. The community is an exclusive members website that is just an extension of what we do here in July at the Central Virginia Sport Performance Seminar. What it is, is a combination of video lectures, a coach's corner with your Monday morning take-home information, and a forum where you can talk about anything and everything related to the field of strength and conditioning. In the community, you'll find content added each month from some of the top practitioners in the world, ranging from PhDs to high-level coaches, bringing you exactly what they're doing with their athletes or their research at the present moment. On top of that, an additional discussion by coaches bringing you that Monday morning information, things that you can add to your training program right away. Tying that in with the opportunity to discuss with coaches around the world in the forum on anything and everything from the topics addressed in these presentations to whatever you're seeing in your daily life as a coach. If this sounds like the right thing for you and your staff, go ahead and hop over to cvasps.com slash community and try it out for 48 hours for just a dollar. If you like it, you're signed up, ready to roll, and you're jumping into all the great content added each month. If not, feel free to go ahead and cancel at any time. No questions asked. We're really excited about what we're building in the community and hope you are too. Go ahead and hop over to cvasps.com slash community and check it out today. All right, so I guess we're live, Doc. I guess we're rolling, my friend. Hey, finally. Yeah, you know, without further ado, I guess we can uh, we can start the first podcast here for cvasps.com. Uh, on the first podcast of many of Friday with the Docs with Dr. Michael Yes. This Doc, thanks for being on. Oh, my pleasure. Uh, well, Doc, I guess we can kind of cut right to the chase. One of the big reasons that we wanted to have you involved was obviously because of your influence in training methodology and bringing over many ideas from Eastern Europe and the former USSR. Um, but I want to kind of focus today on one of the main things that you and when Danny was at dinner with, uh, with us that first night that we talked about, and that's specialized exercises, because I think that that's something that really – you know, lack of a better term, has been kind of bastardized here in the Western world, you know, with, with the whole, you know, functional trend, may we call it. Although some people do very, very good things when they talk about functional, um, whether it be in the therapy side or with, you know, corrective exercise and, and helping people get better physically um, and improving from ailments, uh, it could be said that functional exercise is kind of the the mistake made off of what people should have been doing with specialized exercises. So I guess where we need to start is what was the foundation behind them? And, and meaning from that is it, where did this idea come from? You know, when how did this idea come to Dr. Michael Yes? Okay. Uh, it goes back a little ways, really back to the 80s. See, now, in the Soviet Union at that time, their method of training was based on volume. Every year, if you go back to the 50s, every year was more volume, more volume, more volume. They thought this was the answer to being a better athlete. Then they found out, they got to the point where the athletes couldn't train any longer. They just couldn't handle the loads. But they said, there's got to be a better way. And that's when they hit upon the concept of specialized exercises. And they hit on this idea mainly by looking and examining exactly what the athlete does in his training. Like, for example, plyometrics. This was one of the methods developed by Vereshansky. He studied runners and jumpers, found out a tremendous amount of force is exerted on a landing. And the force is given back very quickly in the takeoff executed in less than one-tenth of a second. Today, your elite runners are executing the uh, touchdown in less than 0.8 seconds. Um, so it's even faster today. But anyway, at that time, that's what it was. So they said to themselves, how can we duplicate this landing and takeoff in an exercise 
so that we can enhance, enhance this ability to land and take off very quickly, which is the secret to running and jumping. So by looking at this, they came up with what they call specialized exercises. It's specific to the act of taking off and running and then jumping. They didn't do this just in running. They did it in many sports. They took a look at what are the key elements. How can we duplicate these key elements to train the athlete in these key elements, which have a direct transfer to their ability to perform on the field or on the court? That was the key. It wasn't just doing the exercise. But by doing this exercise, you became a better performer. It was a direct line. So instead of going for more volume, now they said, let's do the specialized exercises. And then they flip-flopped their training. Before this, about 80% was devoted to volume, 20% devoted to the sport. Now it became 80% devoted to the sport or sport-specific exercises and only 20% to volume. So it was a dramatic change. And this is what they attributed their success to in their future years from the 80s on up. There's no telling what it could have been today if the country didn't break up. But once the country broke up, the whole sports system, for the most part, broke up, especially on the elite level. Mm -hmm. That's pretty That's pretty neat stuff. Especially now, let me, talking... Go let ahead. Me say one other thing here. You started off the functionality, or the people dealing with functionality. If it was true functional training, they would really be doing specialized exercises. But they don't really do true functional training. That's where they fall down. They call it functional, but it's only a general functional. Yeah. It's not specific. Yeah. Now, specific exercises are very specific to a joint action. Yes. And I actually think that a lot of the people that are the – I guess we can use the word gurus in that situation, talking about the functional aspect, would actually say that their functional exercises are actually directed toward the general aspects of movement, um, which, don't get me wrong, it, it's important for, for everybody, you know, to, to be able to do general, basic day in and day out movements that are going to allow you to kind of progress upon one could say. Um, but I, I, I couldn't agree with you more that the, the difference between functional where we could look at just general function of the body and specific or specialized, meaning this is doing something directly in part of, I guess we could say a sporting movement, or, I mean, as, as, you know, what we're going to get to, you know, as a part of the technique or the whole technique um, is kind of where the, there's the, the fork in the road. You know what I mean? Right. And, and, and they are more one way and, and specialized is obviously more the other. And I think that that leads me uh, right into the next question, Doc, is talking about this, um, what defines a specialized exercise? I mean, it, it, let's just go over what you would define it as and what exactly makes a specialized exercise a specialized exercise. And since you've already touched upon it, maybe we can go a little more in depth into the benefits of it. Okay, very good. Okay, the main thing right now is that we want to think of this specialized exercise as just what the term says. It's very special and specific. Rather than using specialized, sometimes I'll say specific exercise. It's very specific to one action or two or three actions. But it's not a general thing. It's very, very specific and defined. And, and most importantly, it has a specific criterion. In relation to the specialized exercise, it has five criterion. The most important one is that the action duplicate the neuromuscular pathway seen in execution of the skill during game play. Mm -hmm. That's the most important one. So in other words, it has to be neurologically, neuromuscularly identical or as close to being identical as possible. Number two, 
strength must be developed in the same range of motion as it is exhibited in game play. Like, for example, I think uh, you asked me about the knee drive that we, we had a discussion on last year. Well, in knee drive, we're developing strength of the hip flexors beginning with the leg behind the body as it occurs in running and driving it forward. And when it gets under the body and moves forward, it's all on inertia. We don't want strength when the thigh is moving upward. We want strength from when the thigh is behind the body to underneath the body. See, now we're developing strength exactly where it's used in the running stride or when taking a quick step forward or anything along these lines. Right. So it's the same idea, that quickness. Yeah. Okay. So that's the second criterion. Third criterion is that it uses the same type of muscular contraction as seen in the uh, competitive event. So in relation to this knee drive, when we take that quick first step or when we're running and sprinting, it has to be a very fast, explosive movement. So we have to develop the muscles in an explosive manner. Now, this doesn't mean we can't do strength or we can't do the exercise slower. We have to develop the strength first. And then we build up to the point where now we can do the exercise explosively. That's the key. Uh, now, there are other um, criteria I don't typically use them. I say, if you can fulfill these three, you've got it. The other would be the amplitude of movement, you know, whether it's going high or low, and the direction. So I think this sometimes is self-explanatory. You've got to drive the thigh forward, not upward. So if we take a look at where it's being used, it kind of overlaps a little bit. So that's why I use these three. But these are the criterion. Now, if you're going to talk about a specialized exercise, it has to fulfill one or more of these criterion. Ideally, all of them at the same time. Sometimes we do one, and that still works. Then we bring in a second one, a third one, and eventually we get them all. Okay, so that's what differentiates it from a general exercise or other what people call specific exercises. Most of these people, specific means using the same muscles as are involved in the sport. It is very general. So this is what we, what we do in general training. This is GPP. Mm -hmm. Once we get into the specialized training, then we have to be very specific as to the criteria in use. Right. Right. You know, and I think, Doc, that the the best point that you brought up, and, you know, it, a lot of that should should really be familiar to most people, you know, that the, the amplitude of movement needs to be proper, the, the rate of force developed or the speed of contraction needs to be proper, um, But the, the, the idea of building upon it, and, and I think that that's something, you know, as, as you kind of saw with, when we sat down in, in April and we went over some of the stuff that, that my kids were doing, I think that that's something that people kind of miss the boat on. And they see that it's like there's these exercises that we're talking about. You know, the pullback and the knee drive and the lunge um, are the three that, you know, I utilize the most both the front and the side lunge when it comes to the, the specialized work with the core. And and people want to go right to that, that snap, 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 real fast action, but they they don't understand that there still needs to be that general preparatory phase to build this as well. And, and the, I think that the one thing that's really important, not just with the general strength development, is actually learning the movement and improving the technique in a slower manner, you know, like how we've talked about the cutting action in the past, um, to, so that they, the kids understand and they get to feel where that point actually is that they're reaching to, you know, in the knee drive when they reach way back with their foot and what, it, what it's like to keep that, that parallel tibia, you know, to the ground and to punch their knee forward. And, I, it, I, you know, you bringing that up, you know, it's it's funny. We're reviewing Brooke Shansky's special strength training, uh, the practice manual, manual for coaches, our staff is right now. And I want to say it's Chapter 2 he talks specifically about that, that he puts a stick figure in the position of the knee drive with the foot way back, 
and he says that this is the way that you need to train the hip flexor going this way, and he has a, another person with a plate on their knee doing just a straight knee lift. It's like this is not a specialized exercise. This is not what we're after. Um, but I think that those are, I mean, you know, and, and his list is longer. I want to say that his list is five or six different criteria, although one or two may be similar to each other in the wording, but I think that, like, when you look at it, those three are actually the perfect way to look at it. Is it the same range of motion? Is it – and is it just as fast? It, it really, to me, are the, the two big ones. Can you, can you do it in the same range of motion, and can it be just as fast? And I, the other thing that I think people miss the boat on is that it can be part of a technique or part of the skill. Right. And I think they look at that and they say, well, if you just get your knee drive better, you know, the, knee, the driving forward action of the knee and running, and all you do is work punch, 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 you're not helping to develop force into the ground. Well, that's where the paw back comes in. It's, it's antagonist, you know, idea that you have to train both aspects of the movement. Um, and I think that that's really awesome. But since we have been talking about those two, and I kind of went on a little rant about them, let's talk about the paw back and the knee drive. Because really, outside of probably you know, swimming and, and skating sports, those are the two that are probably, with the lunge, the most important in any land game you know, when it comes to running. Because everybody's got to run. You know, it doesn't matter what it is, you know, except for maybe golf. But uh, let's talk a little bit about those and why those two are important and just a few, if we can give just some ideas of what it exactly entails. Okay, that's a very good question, Jay. And it has a really simple but complex answer. Uh, the most important is that and this is where I think you're correct in stating that most people overlook the concept that you can develop a small part of the total technique and then incorporate it into the total technique. And this is what we do with the knee drive. There's only one aspect of, of total running. The paw back is another one. Ankle extension is a third one. To me, those are the big three. But all of these are important. But we can enhance each one of these and then incorporate them into the total skill. See, too many people say that, well, if it's going to be specific, you have to do the whole sport. Well, sure, but then you're not going to get better by doing the whole sport all the time. This has typically been the uh, modus operandi, if I can use that term loosely, of developing an athlete in the United States. you got to play the game. This is why we have kids 7, 8, 9, 10 years old playing the game. And they want to be uh, the best in the game by the, by the time they're 12 instead of developing their individual physical abilities. Anyway, I'm going off, on a, going off on a tangent. Back to your question. So we can do these specific parts. And why do we zero in on the knee drive and the paw back? Well, there are a couple of very good reasons for this. The knee drive, well, the knee drive and the paw back, they use up 80% of a runner's energy. In other words, moving the thigh forward and moving the thigh backward is the bulk of your running. This is what's going to fatigue you. That's because it uses so much energy. Forget about that generation of force. I mean, that, that's everybody's gone nuts with the work done by uh, Wei and how you got to keep creating more and more force, which you do. It's very important. But they... Anyway, I won't get into that now. How they misinterpret that. <laughs> uh, but the knee drive, the, that's a very important component to quickly get the leg out in front. But see, since I mentioned Wayne, I, I have to go back to him now because everybody kind of ignores technique. See, according to his study, well, everything, all you need is that force when your foot hits the con uh, on the ground. You've got to generate maximum force on contact. Nobody looks at how you do this. So knowing that you've got to generate maximum force or the elite runner generates the most force. Bull generates over 1,000 pounds of force on contact. 
great. What happens to the forest? Nobody can tell you that. It's not given back vertically. It's not given back as, as a thousand pounds of forest. But nobody studies this. But they all go nuts trying to figure out how am I going to get vertical? How am I going to generate a thousand pounds of forest going upward? Because you had a thousand pounds of forest going down, so you got to now got to have a thousand pounds of forest, thousand pounds of forest going upward. So that's kind of silly. Um, but the forward movement and backward movement. This has been substantiated by a Russian study. I can give you the sources on it. I don't remember the guy's name right now. And by a recent American study, it was reported in Research Today, just a couple of about a month ago already. And it brought out they were they were doing a study to try and find out which joint actions require the most energy for amputees. How can they work on getting the prosthetics to help them? They found out that it was the thigh moving forward and backward. 80% and the other 20% came from the ankle joint extension. These were the three energy users. So to develop, uh, and then once again, two on the uh, knee drive. Why do you need it? Because my analysis of runners, when they start slowing down and changing technique, especially near the end of a race, is because they can't keep driving the knee forward. You take a look at how high the thigh goes, and you see it's getting lower and lower. That's why they slow down. So if you want to improve them by, just by doing that one exercise, you're going to develop a better runner for the distance. He'll be able to maintain his technique for a longer period of time. I bet if you look at most of your players, you'll see near the tail end of the game, they're hardly bringing that thigh up. See? Well, hopefully not anymore. We've been doing them for about three right. years now. So. <laughs> you got it. See, that's the beauty of that exercise. Yeah. See? And the same thing with the pull back. That's the key to generating that force when your foot hits the ground. So the more force you can generate, the more you can load the muscles, in this case, the ankle joint. The more it gets loaded, the more it can give back on a push-off to drive the body forward when the body is way out in front of the body or in front of the toe-off, of the foot at toe-off. See, so that, that amount of force, even though it's only 20%, is still a tremendous amount. And that's what drives the runner forward. Horizontally, not vertically. Although there's a small vertical component, but don't forget a world-class sprinter, uh, his center of gravity or center of mass only goes up about one inch or so. Yeah. yeah. So I hope I answered the question. It took me around about way, but. <laughs> no. Yeah. It, it completely. You know, it's it's understanding that the. The preparation needs to be for where the energy is used the most. And, you know, it, it, that goes back to, again, to what we've been revealing now, you know, with special strength training where he talks about the bioenergetics of the movement have to be the same as well. And you need to prepare the body to – it doesn't matter if I put a, a, a Corvette engine in, you know, a Nissan Sentra if I don't put any gas in the Sentra. You know, it's, right. it's still not going to go anywhere. So understanding that you're you're fixing the technique, you're so you're becoming more efficient and you're improving if you're handling the proper volumes and intensities, you're improving the the bioenergetics of at least that portion of the movement, and then the second portion of the movement being the, the paw back, you've now made yourself more efficient, stronger, faster more explosive at what really turns out to be 80% of the running action. Which right. is, I mean, if you think of it that way, it's really mind-blowing stuff, you know, and it's... It really is. It's, real, it's really simple, too. I mean, it's not like, you know, we've talked about it. It's not like we spend 40 minutes of our hour doing it with, with my guys. I mean, we spend five, eight minutes three to five times a week, depending on the time of the year, working on some of these things, you know, splitting them out throughout the week, you know, depending on how the guys feel. And it, it really has been a, a, a great help, in my opinion, and, and, you know, and in the guy's opinion about how we're moving and how we're performing. So it's, it's, it's something that I think really has been overlooked and that people need to get a better grasp of, you know, in the, 
in the future to really understand how to get these kids better because that's what we're here for. I mean, in the long run, it's just to make these kids better players. So That's, that's the bottom line. Yes, sir. Uh, one thing along those lines, Jay, uh, even to make these exercises easy, like we're talking about the knee drive and the pullback, uh, this is why I developed the active courts, as I think I, I mentioned to you a while back. You take a look at the exercise by Vershansky in his book. See, now I was familiar with those exercises. I saw them all in, when I was in the Soviet Union, when I was with them for over a week. And to do those exercises, I tried duplicating when I came back to the States. And they are cumbersome. We tried putting a weight boot on the foot and standing up on some piece of equipment and trying to drive the thigh up. It, it, it was just impossible. So this is why I developed you know, the act of course, so we can duplicate this action. And many times we do these exercises on the field. We can do it right on a track. Hook it up to a fence and we're ready to go. Or I don't know how you could do it in the, uh, in the gym. Sometimes we hook it up to the bleachers down on the side, but you probably have other ways too. Or mm -hmm. You can even use these exercises, and we haven't gotten to this yet, where you can, uh, before the game starts, or let's say if a guy's been sitting warm in a bench for a long, bench a long time, he can get up and do some of these exercises real quick and then run out, run out on a court, and, boy, he's ready to go. It activates the muscles exactly the way they're going to be used. So it's the best warm-up in the world. And sometimes oh, yeah. they're even quicker. Yeah, and, you know, and, and things that people talk about is, you know, opening up your hips and, and activating different muscles like you were talking about. You know, we, we do it right before we squat, and when we don't, like our guys, they don't squat as well because they're, you know, their hamstrings aren't firing as well and their glutes aren't firing as well because they haven't been through the progression that we go through. Their hip flexors haven't opened up, so they're getting bound up on the way down. Um, so it really, you know, I mean, it's to say that they're foolproof would be over dramatizing it, but it really is. I mean, it's. As soon as you get an eye of where they're supposed to be and, and you're not really afraid to just put your hands on a kid's hips and put them here and pull their foot back until they give you, you know, you know the look that I'm talking about where it's like, oh, yep, that's the spot, and then they learn it. I mean, it's... That's right. Yeah, it's it's just... It's it's, it's foolproof. <laughs> it's been great it's so enough. And it, yeah, and, you know, and with the cords, it's not... The the increments of increase of tension are so minimal that it allows you to consistently make the small progressions so that you can, even if you train at the same resistance a few times, six times, eight times, whatever it may be, you can make a little jump so that you have that kind of elongated, you know, it, the training stays with you longer so that it's more embedded. I mean, these kids are so plastic at 18 to 21 anyway, but the the training in itself allows you just general tweak, general small tweak, small tweak, you know, and it's and, – but they do go heavy. I mean, and there's – we went through a little phase of summer where it was, I wanted them to go as, as heavy as they could and, and really work on snapping down as forcefully as they could and driving through as forcefully as they could with – as heavy of a band resistance as they could handle it, they'll do it right. And it's, 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 they really are awesome, man. And it's, the, it's really a, uh, it's not when you, you look at a lot of the, the tables and the, the tuning things and you're like, this is kind of uh, foo foo type of equipment. I mean, it definitely, there's a definite place for it in the training of athletes and their, you know, in their preparation. And it's, it's something that's really helped, I mean, all the teams that we work with and everybody here, it's implemented, I mean, with the exception of the, the teams in the water. Um, and I don't think the golfers do it, but, again, they don't run. Um, have been using the active courts to implement the pawback and the knee drive and the stretches to get ready for the lunges and then getting into the lunging exercises. Uh, it, it's really fascinating stuff, and it's really, it is, it's, it's, it's simple, it makes sense, and it's it's very easy to implement. Yeah, and then, uh, not well, golfers, by the way, use, use the course on more rotation. Either right. The course, oh, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
just I'm talking about the pawback and the knee drive. I mean, it's not specifically. I mean, those, those two are obvious exercises that are going to benefit them as well. Yeah, I see. The point I'm going to bring out, we have become locked in, more or less, on using barbells and dumbbells, which are great. I'm not taking anything away from them. But I developed the cords to do actions that you cannot do with barbells and dumbbells. See, this is the beauty of them. And most of our sports-specific exercises do not use barbells and dumbbells. We can use them on some, like the lunge you could do with barbell and so on. But when you use the cords, it's completely different because now you can concentrate on driving the hips. Whereas with a barbell on your shoulder, you can't think in terms of accentuating the hips. No. And you're just thinking in terms of stepping out. So the emphasis and the mindset changes, you know, depending upon the equipment that you use. Oh, without a doubt. Without a doubt. Well, Doc, I think that this was absolutely awesome stuff. I'm really excited, and I'm sure that uh, the folks that swing by the page are really going to really gonna find this information Let me... fascinating. And it's, uh, I hope that they're excited to check out some more about it and, you know, Explosive running, explosive basketball, building an efficient athlete, all have information about this in there. Uh, I talked about it in Pennsylvania, and that presentation will be up on the site soon. I think that, you know, this is something that we'll, we'll definitely touch base about again here in a couple of weeks. Um, and I think that there's a, there's a lot we can talk about with this. You know, even almost return to play ideas and things like that, I think that this is, a, this is an area of, of – preparation for athletes that I think that really combine a lot of different facets of the, the overall picture that people are kind of overlooking. And it's uh, it's really helped us a lot, and I really hope we can help other people with it. Yeah, I hope so, and I agree wholeheartedly with you, Jay. Awesome. Well, thanks again, Doc, and we will, uh, we'll talk soon, my friend. Okay, same here, and thank you, Jay. Thanks. Great. Bye.